Well, good morning, little masters, and welcome back to today's Tolkien Times. I'm the man of the West, also from the Prancing Pony podcast, and I want to welcome you to Fandom Friday. Now, every Friday, we visit with somebody from the wider world of the Tolkien fandom. Musicians, artists, craftsmen, scholars, content creators, and the like. Today, we're welcoming Fornad from Artacraft, also known as Jack, to today's Tolkien Times to talk about this breathtaking project. Hello, I am uh, honored to be here. I've been a fan of the podcast since I think 2018. So oh, wow. I am, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, been, it's been in my background for many years. And so it's fantastic to, to find Excellent. Me. Well, it's a real pleasure to have you here. And, you know, I want to spend most of our time today talking about Artacraft. Of course, it's breathtaking stuff. But I also want to ask you the question that I typically get to ask guests, either here or on the Prancing Pony podcast. When did you first encounter Tolkien's works? And what is it that keeps you coming back? So, unfortunately, uh, Alan, I have terrible news. I was six years old when Peter Jackson's Fellowship of the Ring released uh, in theaters. <laughs> oh, um, man. This is just going to so, get worse and worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's happening to me already. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. Um, My parents so, told me about lining up to watch the movie. It was before I was born. <laughs> That's going to be the next thing I hear. Yeah, yeah. We, we have people joining the server who were like kids when The Hobbit released, so I'm not, you know, it's, it's, I understand as well. Um, so fallen is the word that comes to mind, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so like many others in my generation, you know, so sort of millennials, Gen Z, uh, I was, I, my first contact with this world was through the films. Yeah. Um, but I was, I was gifted, uh, the sort of Lord of the Rings and Hobbit box set books, uh, by a friend a few years later, mm -hmm. um, started with the Hobbit, took me a few years to get around to Lord of the Rings. Um, and then yeah. from that point onwards, I was hooked. Um, what keeps me coming back? Um, well, there's two things that come to mind um, among many others that I'm sure others have brought up. But really, for me, it's two things. I, I mean, I have a love for a deep love for history and, and also a love for the natural world. And mm. both of those, I think, were informed and encouraged by Tolkien. Yeah. Um, okay. So firstly, I mean, the, the sense of historical uh, verisimilitude that runs throughout the Lord of the Rings, right? Like you really feel like yeah. what you are reading is a text from the deep past and not just something that was written in the 1940s you right. know, and 50s by, by someone. And, and of course, Tolkien had you know, the perfect blend of knowledge and experience to make that work. And, and I, I've never quite encountered that with another author, um, no. that kind of sense of reality. And then, and then on the natural front, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to have grown up in both uh, Scotland, the Highlands, and then the Alps later on in life. Oh, wow. I, I had some very outdoorsy parents. And so yeah. uh, I ended up becoming a keen hiker and falling in love with the natural world. And, uh, well, exactly. Yeah, right. It's, it's, it's in your back door. So, yeah. so there have been many times when I've been in the woods and mountains and I've, and I've kind of stopped and I've, I've looked around and I thought, well, here I am. I'm in Middle Earth, right? Yeah. And, and that's something that Tolkien said himself, right? He said many times Middle Earth is just our own world in a kind of imagined past and, mm -hmm. and its landscapes are drawn from landscapes that he knew. Um, and for me, it's kind of a two-way street, right? It's like my appreciation for nature means I appreciate Middle Earth more, and my appreciation for the legendarium means that yeah. the landscapes are given a certain, you know, extra magic, right? Um, so yeah, that then plays into Artacraft itself. Right? Exactly. Well, that yeah. was the thing. So the third thing is Artacraft just means I'm sort of semi-immersed in this world all the time and thinking all about it time. all the time. So, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, that does segue perfectly into my first question about the project. You're the project lead for Artacraft. And for those who don't know, that's a Minecraft server that's attempting to recreate Middle-earth brick by brick, the entirety of the place. So tell us about the genesis of this project. When and how did the idea come into your head to build Middle Earth in a game? And why Minecraft? Or was it Minecraft first and then, hey, let's build Middle Earth in here? Right, yeah. So um, the project started back in 2014. I'd encountered Minecraft a, a couple of years beforehand. And, you know, Minecraft as a game, you know, it has a couple of advantages, I think, when it comes to this over maybe some other things. So people might wonder, well, why not do this in, you know, um, uh, you know, Unreal Engine or one of these other Yeah, engines. right. And, and there's a couple of things. Well, the, the first thing being um, accessibility, you know, <laughs> the, the fundamental mechanics of building in this game are very simple. You know, you, you, you left yeah. click to destroy, uh, sorry, you left click to destroy and right click to place. And although the learning curve to become truly skilled takes, you know, a number of years, you can learn mm -hmm. the basics pretty quickly. 
someone who's never played the game before can you know spend a couple of weeks practicing and join our team as an apprentice whereas the time it takes to become oh, skilled really, in yeah, yeah right years and actually but those sorts of people want to be paid for their work right we're a volunteer <laughs> well, project yeah. so well, so yeah yeah exactly so so it's great from that perspective and, and it allows us to build a team of the size we need to do this because this is the largest recreation in middle earth that's ever been attempted anywhere it's two wow. and a half it's two and a half thousand square kilometers you know it's larger than lord of the rings online um <clears throat> so it's huge wow. and the that second is- yeah exactly and the second thing is a legal reason right because mm. middle earth of course is still copyrighted um right. there was a case 10 years ago which i often think back to there was a, a project called middle earth role playing or merp mm-hmm. uh, yeah. and they were trying to recreate middle earth using the skyrim engine and what happened oh. there is that warner brothers sent them a cease and desist letter and said mm. stop doing this and the reason that Warner Brothers did that is because they were working on Shadow of Mordor and they didn't want any right. uh, competition from a fan project, you know, coming in and ruining, you know, their profit yeah. margin or whatever it is. So from from our perspective, probably Minecraft is seen in a different light. What we are doing is yeah. essentially a massive fan arts project rather than we're not trying to right. create quests and characters and things in this world. It is yeah, there's just, not a game setting. It's just a world. Exactly. A exactly. Yeah. So my hope is that we can do all of this stuff. And, and, and because we're a fan project, you know, unlike Lord of the Rings Online, we have access to Unfinished Tales and Silverillion and stuff that we can draw yeah. from. Um, my hope is with that as a background, we can be somewhat insulated and somewhat safe from to any potential legal issues. So, those well, the fact that you made it this far suggests maybe that's the case. I, I would hope so. Yeah. yeah. We've stayed under yeah. the radar at least. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, my next question has to do with uh, an interesting decision that you made, and I'm wondering, I'm wondering why. The map of Articraft is set in early fall of Third Age 3006. Now, that's 12 years before Frodo leaves the Shire. What made you choose that time as the setting? I mean, you could have set it a little earlier when Bilbo left, or let's say 3018 when Frodo begins the quest. Mm. Well, so 3006 was kind of chosen as a, uh, not exactly a midpoint between Bilbo's birthday party in 3001 and, and the quest in 3018. Um, the reason being, if we said it in 3018, Middle Earth is at that point on the brink of war, right? So, True. so yeah. you know, Isengard has already had its trees cut down, most likely. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. You know, yeah. there are, there are you know, uh, elements of the map where, where you know, Middle Earth is sort of at active war. And I think what mm-hmm. we wanted to try and represent was okay. What is the what is the normal state of affairs? You know, what okay, is, you know, so just before the the violence breaks out, exactly, around exactly. Yeah, like like you yeah. know, we we have we we can because it's only twelve years before we can draw on all of the descriptions in Lord of the Rings and trust that they are accurate to the time. Mm-hmm. But we right. don't have to think about okay, well, what is going on with the you know the war and, and how is this? How do we need to build fortresses out? here? Or do we need to have you know a standing army here? That kind of thing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And and yet it's also late enough because it isn't let's say you know before Bilbo's adventure. So now Dale has been rebuilt. Exactly. And right. Maze Town has been rebuilt. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's that's, that that's it. Um, okay. Yeah. And and then and actually the time of year is really important to us as well because yeah you know we yeah. we then have to think about okay so you know. Um, how does Middle Earth look from space at this time? You know, what are the different colors yeah. of, of grass that you'd get and, and vegetation throughout? You know, what were the farming site? Like, you know, the farming year changes. So you have to, you know, think yeah. about, well, probably further south, they've already harvested their crops, whereas in the Shire, they're just beginning to because of the Maybe getting close to harvest time. Exactly. Yeah. So there's a whole raft of things that come with the time so it of It gives year. you more more variability then than, let's say, spring. Yes, I think so. Yeah, spring. autumn is nice, and, and the end of summer is nice. Yeah. And I think, you know, winter is difficult for lots of reasons. So yeah, it, yeah. it just becomes, you know, we, our, our choices okay. get constrained. Yeah, yeah. I would imagine they would. Yeah. That's true. Well, speaking of constraints and, you know, the, the, the limits of, the engine, the limits of you know the, the the legal concerns that you expressed before. What is the biggest individual challenge that you and the team have had to overcome, and how did you overcome it? That's a difficult one. Um, <laughs> that's a really hard one. Top 10. Yeah, <laughs> top ten. Oh, I can, I can go on. Yeah. No, uh, we don't have time for the top ten. But yeah. But no. Throw one or two uh, yeah, I think I think there's a few. Th- I mean, wh- one thing that definitely comes to mind is, you know, wh- what we are trying to do here is we're trying to recreate something from. The books, right? We are, we're trying to yeah. we're trying to see Middle Earth through a lens other than the Peter Jackson films. So, mm-hmm. you know, trying to come to agreements amongst the builders, you know, how are we going to interpret this location? That can be that can be challenging sometimes. Mm. 
um, yeah. for sure. And, you know, how, like sometimes Tolkien is great and it gives us a watercolor or, or a picture of an image, you know, place and we can just go, right. well, that's what we're doing. But most of the time yeah. he doesn't. Uh, and so most of the time we have to go, well, okay, what are the inspirations for this area? Right. You know, what are the, what is the climate? What is the latitude? What are the historical societies that we can draw upon to, yeah. to, to base this architecture off and all that stuff. But, but you know, that, that changes. There's so many questions I have. I want to talk to you for like an hour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we can go <laughs> on. But I'm immediately thinking of architecture and history and all of these things. Oh man. Yeah. Good stuff. I mean, this is it. I mean, really, uh, the, the, the challenge is almost taking the, 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 the incredible world that Tolkien gave us, but then going, okay, well, Tolkien is writing in a very sort of uh, high medieval or ancient way where the story is mm -hmm. very focused on the elites of Middle Earth, right? You know, we're really focused True. on you know, the royalty and the princes and, the, and the, you know, this and that. But actually, most yeah, people, yeah. when we're recreating the world, most people are just peasants and they're farmers and they're living yeah. in the, you know. They're just farmers, they're subsistence farmers. Exactly, and that's about exactly. It. So it's like, well, we're, we're, the 90% of the work ends up being recreating the lives of these people which talking you know wrote a little bit about but mostly yeah, really, yeah. you know so we see bits and pieces of bits and pieces, yeah. you, know, you get sam ganji but then everyone else in the fellowship is, like, is you know the bourgeoisie and the, and the royalty right? really? yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly so so you really the have to man leads running the whole place i know exactly so so you really have to think about okay so what are the bits of middle of the yeah. he told me he was a linguist and, and everything and he understood all that stuff really well but he wasn't an economist he wasn't a demographer he wasn't yeah. a botanist or he does botany very well he wasn't a geographer, and so we have all of these elements of the world to fill in in his place. And I think oh. that is the that is the joy okay. of the project, but it's also probably the biggest challenge, I would say. And probably fair to say that it hasn't yet been overcome because you're still building. Well, exactly, it's a <laughs> challenge, <laughs> new challenges project, every right. day. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Well, for those who are interested in finally getting a look at this, you know, maybe maybe they're not Minecraft people in the first place, so they didn't know. Tell me, where can folks find Artacraft and learn more and maybe walk through the world themselves? Yes, so we have a website um, that is artacraft.me. It's in Middle Earth, so artacraft.me. Oh, okay. uh, you can go there. Uh, we have all the information on the website. We also have you know, all the normal things, socials, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, all these things. Um, but yeah, we have a, a page on our website that explains how to install uh, the, uh, our, our mod pack and, and run it. And it's very easy. Uh, as long as you own a copy of the game, that's it. That's all you need. Um, and okay. you can you can hop on and, and join that. If you don't own a copy of the game, we also have a YouTube channel and everything. So you can follow us through, uh -huh. through all those, those uh, ways as well. That's right. And that, that was some of my first encounter with it was at Token Reading Day when we got to walk through well, I had seen it before, but to, to walk through it all day, literally, with Jordan's long-expected soundscape and all the readings was really fantastic. That was a great experience. Yeah, to, to walk through it is is really the thing to actually yeah. follow. I mean, you can you can follow the path of fellowship at the moment all the way yeah. through to you know Edoras Helm's Deep from the mm. Shire. So to actually walk through it and it's how long like, does it take then to walk from the Shire to Edoras if you're following the fellowship? Following the fellowship, probably. Ooh, I'd have to guess, but going through Moria as well as a good bit, um, I would I would have to estimate something like eight or nine hours, probably. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that's that's quite a scale. I mean, that is a big, big it's game. It's enormous. Yeah. We've got a, a map that actually shows how large our map is compared to you know Skyrim and The Witcher Three and things, and just how enormous oh, wow. it is compared to these these other games that people want to get. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That was great. Well, folks, check it out. Seriously. That is it for today's Fandom Friday, though. But come back next time to meet another of your fellow Tolkien fans and maybe even learn what niches of the community you might be interested in exploring. Maybe you'll be the next person building an artifact. And if you're interested in joining me here on today's Tolkien Times for a future Fandom Friday, let me know by emailing barnuman at theprancingponypodcast.com. And as always, if these few minutes leave you wanting more Tolkien content, be sure to check out the Prancing Pony podcast, where we've spent seven years so far walking through the books and having a nice chat at the pub about our favorite author. And joining me again tomorrow on today's Tolkien Times as we wrap up our week and the first eight-week series with Silmarillion Saturday. Please like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you're listening on a podcast app, be sure to follow or subscribe to make sure every episode gets downloaded to your device. And please follow at Tolkien Times on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And in the words of Faramir, go with the goodwill of all good men. <laughs>